Yes, hello everyone. Today I have another very special guest. And first of all, I want to say this. I am learning through my life more and more to trust the spirit. If the God and spirit guides me to certain people, to reach out to them, to contact them, I don't think twice. I just follow that advice and I have to tell you how I came across Robert Campbell, who is my special guest today. I saw on YouTube, he posted a comment under one of the, I don't even remember exactly what it was, what channel, but he posted a comment and that comment was so interesting and so captivating. I said, oh my gosh, I have to contact this gentleman and like brainstorm with him and listen to his knowledge. And again, the spirit was right because this is an incredible man, everyone. I tell you briefly what I have here about Robert because he was an airline pilot and Robert, please correct me if I'm uh, making any mistake here. And you are the captain from 70s until the mid 90s, right? Well, I, was, I was a captain for a cargo airline in the um, 70s. And okay. then in the 90s, I. I had my own aerial photo business and um, I was asked to fly as captain for the Otis Spunkmeyer company, which ran two DC-3s for air tours. Mm -hmm. And I was on the national air show circuit with uh, one of the DC-3s in 1997. So, um, and your business, the aerial photography business is still something that you do. And later on, I will attach the links to uh, Robert website because his pictures images are stunning but i tell you guys why i wanted to talk to robert first of all robert had five encounters with ufo ships literally he experienced this in person and one of those was recorded another thing is that robert um robert's father had been working as robert would explain to us um, with CIA and Robert has a lot of a lot of knowledge as far as how the planes work and how the crashes happen he can really tell us from the professional standpoint for example uh, JFK jr. and that um, accident what is his take on, on it so I want to welcome Robert I'm very grateful for your time um, he's also living in California so we can talk about that as well because he has a lot of insight and knowledge about the current situation in the world spiritually wise and all this transition to greatness so welcome robert thank you for having time to talk to me today um and i would like to start with you if you can tell us a little bit about your father and that relationship with cia that he had great well thank you uh, anya it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, I, I was born in 1944, and my, my parents were very special people. I think I chose well. And um, my father was a, uh, a well-known psychiatrist in San Francisco. And um, <clears throat> but we lived, when I was five years old, we lived in London and Paris for a year. And my father was supposedly working at the uh, U.S. Embassy. He didn't really tell me then what was going on. And of course, I was more interested in trains, planes, automobiles, and, and uh, fun. But uh, so, and I remember um, snatches, you know, that a kid would. But as I grew up, um, they encouraged me to be independent and curious and uh, allowed me to explore anything I wanted to. And uh, my father shared a lot with me um, philosophically. Uh, and some specifics, but um, as, I, as I grew older, I, I put two and two together and figured out that he was actually working with the CIA, mm -hmm. probably as an asset. Now, the CIA was, was very new then. It was created in 1947, so, and we were in the midst of the fledgling Cold War at that time, and uh, we had the Red Scare and, and a commie under every rock that the, uh, was coming out of the uh, Senate uh, and the House. And so, you know, people were afraid, and, and, and so the, the uh, Soviet Union became the boogeyman that we were all to fear. And uh, so my father knew just so much, and he would let things drop. And I, 
it's one of those things where you, once you know a bit, then you start learning more and you become curious. And so I just dove into everything. Uh, my father told me, I guess I was in my twenties that uh, at the height of the hippie movement that he took acid with Tim Leary, Timothy Leary. Who was, and, that? Who was that Robert? I don't know that. Who oh, Timothy Leary was the, um, the LSD guru for the hippies. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, tune in. Uh, something to tune in, drop in and drop out or something like that. I can't remember the, the thing, but he, yeah, when LSD became uh, popular, but that was actually a CIA operation. The whole hippie movement was a CIA operation. Was, wow. And I learned I, this from my father. Wow. Yeah. The Beatles were um, a creation of the Tavistock Institute in London. So this all was, the whole movement was a uh, cabal operation. Uh, deep state global cabal operation. So Robert, and, this was, um, this was MK, just, at MK Ultra, really, right? With the Beatles. Right, yeah, at that time. Yeah, that was going on at the same time. Now, <clears throat> and if you look at the Beatles, they were um, promoting drugs. Rock and roll was created right. at that time. Uh, you know, and even Charles Manson. My, now, now, we lived in San Francisco right above the Haight-Ashbury on mm -hmm. Twin Peaks. Now we were on the highest residential street in the city and had this view from Point Benita outside the Golden Gate all the way to uh, Alameda. Uh -huh. And uh, so I kind of overlooked everything or I was overlooking everything. And, um, but we, we would go down to the Haight-Ashbury Haight to, uh, to shop and uh, when I was young before it became the hippie mecca. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was just a nice little neighborhood. But the CIA also had a um, uh, Victorian house on, uh, I think it was Cole Street in the Haight Ashbury. And they managed that whole scene. Um, but, I mean, we, we can get into Charles Manson and how they created him too, but, um, you know, that's another story, I think. So, anyway, my father <coughs> just, he knew a whole lot and he, he would pass things on to me. And then um, later on, when I started flying for the cargo airline in 1969, uh, <coughs> I was flying to LA. Uh, LAX a lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we, we'd get into LA and um, our hangar was right next to Armand Hammer's Occidental Petroleum Hangar. Now Armand Hammer was flying for the Soviet Union in his Gulfstream II twice a month. And I'd talk with his pilots. So his pilots um, would say that before they entered the Soviet Union, they had to land in Helsinki, Finland. Right. And pick pick up a Soviet navigator. And they said that all the way to Moscow from Helsinki that the navigator was speaking to uh, the Soviet air traffic control and telling them the airplane's position. Well, now we were getting from our government and media that the Russian radars were so good that we had to develop new bombers and techniques to defeat the Soviet radar. Well these pilots told me that the Soviets didn't have any radar. So wow. it was, yeah, it was all a psychological operation. And Unbelievable. Media. Yeah, so the media has been, uh, well, that was Operation Mockingbird that they started with the media. And <clears throat> so that it, we've been- So your father, a, Robert, sorry. So your father was actually in a way part of this Operation Mockingbird, right? Uh, no, he was an asset. He, I okay. think he, we lived in, in London during a time of um, uh, spy scares and uh, a great fear of uh, homosexuality. And, and uh, right. yeah, they were, they were afraid that homosexuals could be blackmailed. So therefore there was some big scare. Well, you know, that ended up with um, the Cambridge Five, which was uh, Bilby Burgess McLean and uh, Blunt and the other, uh, John Cairn Cross who uh, in the 1960s or so were outed and um, Philby escaped to, um, to Moscow. Mm -hmm. But that was the great spy scandal then. So, th but this whole thing was going on for years. Uh, it started in World War II. But you, it's you know what amazes me, Robert, that you grew up already in a way, your soul chosen, your parents, especially your father, 
in such a such a background and such a setup that it prepared you for this journey ahead because that was incredible like to to witness this from the child's standpoint you know what i mean right my father had he, he was basically in san francisco so he he worked with the cia off and on um margaret mead the anthropologist was a good family friend close family friend as was gregory bateson and they've both been outed now as being CIA agents or assets. And um, it's, I do mean, I could go. Robert, sorry, do you think that now within the next four years of, you know, the, the presidency, do you think that agency will be completely gone? Oh, I, I think so. Okay. I, I, and, and really now it's, um, the CIA is based in uh, Switzerland, actually. And uh, so it's, that you, you have to get away from the idea of individual countries. The cabal is global, and that's what they've been aiming for. So, you know, when, they, when George H.W. Bush was president, he was talking about uh, the, the New World Order yep. and a thousand points of light. Well, when he was talking about that in um, 1988, 89, we used to joke that he was talking about a thousand pints of light, you know, <laughs> meaning light beer, but uh, just joking. Yeah. But in the 70s, in the 70s, there was, um, the media was somewhat wide open. Uh, there was KSAN radio in San Francisco and uh, KFAT radio out of Gilroy uh, near Monterey. And, uh, so they, they were wide open about things. We were um, on to Watergate two years before the mainstream media picked up on it. Um, and, and that wasn't censored until about 1980 when they uh, shut down KSAN as a freeform rock station and news station and uh, turned it into a, you know, frack packaged country western station. So, you know, the, the, and then all of a sudden um, they pushed, um, Wall Street investments became the big thing and everyone became an entrepreneur, you know, yes. investing in Wall Street. Yes. But that was a, uh, that's all a distraction because Wall Street is just a rigged casino anyway. Yep, and, that's true. Yep. But the thing so, is that I, because of my background, mm -hmm. as I said, I, I was encouraged to investigate and I did. <laughs> and and uh, we talked about it at home, you know, and with my parents. So, um, so yeah, Robert, may I ask you now, when you encounter the, the UFOs, and I haven't mentioned this to, to my um, viewers before, that I had actually three encounters. Two, two was with the ship and one was with the extraterrestrial, but that's a different story. I want to ask you about mm -hmm. your story, because one of those um, meetings, let's say, you were literally recording the very event. So I want to ask you, how was that for you? And is there any way like we can see this recording if someone wants to see it or no? Um, that recording, I, I was in 1995, I was hired by a documentary team uh, because I, I did aerial video work and had camera mounts on my airplanes for video cameras. And uh, there, there had been a lot of reports of uh, UFO sightings around Clear Lake, California. And so this documentary, TV documentary team was going to uh, investigate. And uh, so they, I met them at um, Lower Lake Airport in, uh, near Clear Lake. And uh, they filmed me um, getting ready to go search for UFOs. And it was all very made up dramatic. But anyway, we got airborne, um, my, myself and my crew. And we ended up over Lake Lakeport, which is on the western part of Clear Lake, uh, overlooking the Andrew Alexander Valley. And uh, I looked down towards Point Reyes, and I saw four lights coming towards us at pretty good speed. And so I got a, got our, the wing-mounted camera on it. And the wing-mounted camera is something that I aim and I have control over, and I have a monitor on the instrument panel so I could see it. And frame it. And uh, so I watched, followed these things and I timed them. And there were four, uh, before they got up to around Santa Rosa area, one of them broke off and, and went up out of sight just rapidly. 
and then dove back down and rejoined the other three. And they kept on going up towards Ukiah. And I got video of them as they passed and the lights, they were all blinking lights. And uh, it, it was fascinating. They, the color and the lights was very strange. It was unusual, not, not like normal aircraft lights. What was it like, if you can describe Robert, if, if you remember the, the, the color or the energy? It, it, was, it was like um, much of the spectrum. Mm. And, and it was quite intense. And uh, I'll get to this, but anyway, we, it, it was dark and there were no lights at the airport. So I had to go land at Petaluma. And uh, then the next day I gave the beta cam footage to the uh, TV people, the documentary people. And uh, a few days later, I got a call from NASA Ames down in Mountain View. And they wanted me to come down and, and look at the footage on their high resolution monitors. So I drove down there and uh, met with uh, about four or five guys. And we sat and we looked at the footage. And video has 30 frames per second. Each Betacam video had 30 frames per second. But each frame is made up of two fields. So you've got 60 fields per second. And we found out by looking at their high speed monitor or their slow monitors, um, high resolution that the flashes of light were only in one field of the frame. So mm -hmm. it was, they were flashing at 1 60th of a second and they, and they didn't fill both fields of the uh, frame, which was very interesting. Wow. And then the NASA people said that the footage matched very closely with a, a recent uh, sighting down in New Zealand. And uh, that's why they were interested because these sightings were being seen in several parts of the uh, world, but the, the other footage was done in New Zealand. So may I ask you this, thank you for, for sharing Robert, may I ask you this, when you were in this very moment when you saw that those lights, um, was there a, a certain feeling within you? How did you feel when you saw that? You know, I was so busy keeping them in frame, <laughs> flying the airplane at the same time that I, <laughs> you know, I, I felt fine. I, I, I love it up in the air. I, that's where I'm most at home. But uh, it, was, no, I, I, it wasn't spiritual. It was just you were recording. No, <laughs> I didn't have time for spiritual there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, my other encounters were uh, one in 1973. That was the first one that I can remember. And I was uh, on a cargo run from San Francisco International into the Central Valley to, it was actually a mail run to uh, Fresno, uh, Merced, Bakersfield, uh, etc. And um, I was down over San Luis Reservoir, which is south of Tracy. And I looked up towards Tracy and Stockton area. And it was more toward the coastal mountains west of Stockton and Tracy. I saw maybe 10 or 12 lights that were just kind of bouncing or traveling from ground level all the way up to almost out of sight and then diving back down again. And it was just, it's like they were playing chase. I love it. <laughs> and, and they were playing chase and, and um, it, I, I watched it for about five minutes. I even altered course so I could keep them in vision. And it was just glorious. It was one of those very clear nights, uh, winter nights in the valley. And uh, I, I just had a, I had to laugh. It was like the children were out playing. Wow. I mean, that's, that's what came to me. Uh, next one was coming in from Phoenix. I was about over Palm Springs in a DC-3 uh, night cargo, probably 1.30 in the morning, 1 to 1.30 in the morning. And over Los Angeles, there were several large objects that, that were lighted but they were also lighted from the glow of the city underneath. Mm -hmm. The city underneath was bathed in the, uh, the smog. The smog went up to about 7,000 feet. It was just a, a glow and that illuminated these um, large ships that were just floating very slowly above LA. And uh, then as I got closer, I kept, they stayed there and just floating around. Uh, and then I descended on, you know, on approach into LAX and, uh, got lost in the muck, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the thick smog. So uh, 
I lost them then, but that was kind of an, an interesting. So they are, Robert, they are trying to, I mean, this is clear to me. They are communicating with you. It could be. They are. I, and I, yeah. So maybe the next step will be, you will meet the extraterrestrial and they will invite you on board. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Um, the closest one I had was coming into um, Oakland Airport from LAX. So, Robert, one second. So this was this is all yeah. California, right? All of those were in California. Oh yeah, all all California, yeah, all in California. Okay. And um, yeah, there have been a lot of sightings in in uh, LA area, and uh, there there is a base actually off Malibu. Uh, you can find it on Google Earth. Mm -hmm. It's very apparent. Uh, Google was hiding it for a while, but it's now been restored, at least last I looked. Mm. And it's it's just a very flat area under the ocean with uh, columns, with pillars holding it up. And uh, according to John Lear, that's one of the access points to the um, interstates uh, because the ocean, uh, there are channels. I didn't know uh, it. Wow. Yeah, the, the U.S. Navy has a, um, a weapons station in Henderson, Nevada. I live there. Oh my uh, God, Robert, I live yeah. in Henderson. No way. <sighs> yeah, that big lake there. What's, uh, what's the name of the lake? Lake uh, Mead. Lake Mead. It's when, no, you, no, go that's, to, that's when you go to Hoover Dam. No, no, I'm sorry. No, it's Hawthorne, Nevada. I meant Hawthorne, Nevada. Okay. That's northern. That's closer to Reno. Okay. But there's Hoover something going yeah. okay. There's stuff going on under Las Vegas, too, because there's Creech Air Force Base and Indian Springs. Mm -hmm. And then you get into. Um, Charles Hall and his encounters in the 60s with the tall whites that the uh, Air Force was um, hiding there. But that's Charles Hall, look him up. That's a very I interesting book. Yes, let his books, um, he has books, uh, Millennial Hospitality are his books. And that's just his autobiography of that time. So yeah, very interesting, a, a nice, very relaxed read, a very warm read, which is um, so, so can I ask you, there are two, two things that are very fascinating when we were talking over the phone. One was about JFK Jr. and your mm -hmm. description, your opinion about the, his plane crash. Um, and another one was, and I, I was, this is totally how I believe in this, that from the very young age, you had this moment when you knew that you would be a pilot and there was a reason behind it, but then you were explained. So Robert, tell me please. So this whole situation with JFK Jr., the whole plane crash, I am by all means, I have no idea about planes, except I like to travel. But can you tell me right. your, your professional opinion, how, how was that, is this staged or what was it with this plane crash of his? Well, at, at the time in 1999, July 1999, that um, the crash happened, that was a shock to everybody. And I'm familiar with flying in that area of uh, Long Island Sound and up to uh, Martha's Vineyard and Block Island, that area. <clears throat> so when the, the media was talking about um, JFK Jr. Uh, and the weather was very murky and he was not instrument rated and they were just started playing him up as a, mar a marginal pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't ring true with me because the aviation magazines, uh, Flying Magazine and another one had done reports, uh, interviews with him and stories on him about what a careful pilot he was. He had over 800 hours in the air and uh, that he flew if he in doubt with anything, he took a flight instructor with him because he was very close to getting his instrument rating. So someone who's that close to getting an instrument rating is not going to get spatially disoriented. And then I, right after I heard about it, I got onto the FAA weather and I checked the weather for the area around Long Island and uh, in Connecticut and uh, Martha's Vineyard. And the weather was 10 miles visibility. And that's as high as the FAA reports. They don't report it if it's over that. They used to, but then they, in the 90s, they just said 10 miles or 10 miles plus. Uh, so that the visibility was fine that night. And I thought, well, this is very strange. So I, I knew that they were lying and I realized that it was probably an assassination. 
at that point. I had no idea that there was anything else involved until about two and a half, three years ago. So how you feel now, Robert, knowing what you know, and do you feel he's still alive? I, I think so. I do. There, there's a lot of controversy on the web right now. It was, um, people were talking about it was a certainty and then it's been debunked by a few um, YouTube and web bloggers. But um, so as I say, there, there are some people arguing over it and I just say, okay, I'll wait and see. But I'll tell you what, I, about two and a half, three years ago, I was looking at Field McConnell uh, and uh, he was talking with, uh, I think, Juan O'Savin, and they were talking about how the uh, JFK's bodyguards, or the people who watch out for him, found the uh, plastic explosive, or the Semtex, whatever it was, uh, wrapped around the uh, baggage compartment with an altitude switch, and that the altitude switch was um, switched out. I mean, they took it out and replaced it with just a remote and that a Navy pilot had actually flown the plane, played a recording of JFK's voice to the um, Martha's Vineyard Tower, which acknowledged his call. And then the pilot bailed out, hit the remote trigger, blew up the plane, and it crashed. Now, I heard that a, an ELT, an emergency locator transmitter, had been placed on the other side of Martha's Vineyard, which threw off the searchers. And that's a an accident transmitter that goes off when a plane goes down. So uh, that threw off the searchers for a while. And then the media came out with a, um, a picture of the fuselage, but it wasn't, it was uh, just the ribs of the fuselage, like an airplane that was under construction. Mm -hmm. It was totally intact, not, uh, no skin had been put on it, but it wasn't bent or anything. And I thought that's very strange because if you dive into the water from 2,500 feet, you're going to crumple that thing. It's just aluminum. So, so they really, Robert, they really, they really are putting those informations and thinking that everyone is stupid and no one will figure out. Yeah, they think we're stupid. And then when you think about it, they're pretty stupid too, actually, for even mm -hmm. putting it out like that, you know. Very much. But, yeah, well, this comes down to our education. What, what do we know? You know, we're products of our education. If they control our education, they control what we know. And unless people get curious, yes. they're not going to search. No critical thinking, because they tell you what is right and what is wrong, and you have to accept. And if you don't accept, then they call you stupid. That's right. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's going to comes into our division now. It's, uh, you know, if you want to get into the ascension or whatever's happening uh, now, is that this is much more than political change. Yes. Absolutely. This is, this is absolutely much more than political change. So Robert, how you see, before I ask you, I have two more questions. No. How you see the, we talk about this on the phone, but the, this transition now into Nasara Jasara with, with California especially, because you live there and I still live here and I'm not mm -hmm. sure for how long, but um, I want to hear from you. There's a lot of people who live in California and they watch it. And I know that you know, even if people don't live here, Robert, I've noticed mm -hmm. people are literally praying for the state because they know how much is at stake here. Right. Well, California is the cabal's playground. I, I was the uh, photographer for the St. Francis Yacht Club because I was a sailor. And being the photographer, I didn't have to pay their exorbitant entrance fees or initiation fees. And so I was kind of hobnobbing with the uh, San Francisco elite and wealthy and they're on their toy boats and you know i got the sale without owning the thing and having the expense but i was asked to join the bohemian club and i just decided not to because i'm really not a club person i uh, mm -hmm. i don't need that so um you know i, I prefer to uh, have my alone time uh, to research and think and fly and stuff. so um i i learned an awful lot and um you know i heard about plans for the state and and really the cabal wants St. California for their own playground. I mean, it's wonderful. Where where else can we get such marvelous world, you know, uh, year round weather? Uh, it's, you know, I can't think of any place else to go really. It's, a, it's humid in much of the South and the East. Um, it's cold in the 
northern states in Canada at, in the winter. So, um, you know, here in California on the Russian River, I don't have the commute to uh, Florida or whatever, or the migration in winter. And um, so anyway, the cabal likes it here and um, they've been working to uh, take over the state. So this gets into Agenda 30 uh, or Agenda 21 yeah. and 30 from yeah. the UN, which is trying to drive us out into the uh, cities. And, uh, you know, it's, just, it's a long process that they're, they're taking a long view on it. But, uh, I think that right now that uh, California is under control and what we're seeing is mainly optics to educate most of the people as to how bad the um, Democrats or the cabal is and that it's going to play out. And that gets into Nassara too, which is, um, Nassara is actually, uh, the financial system is live now. If you go to um, Operation Disclosure Blogspot, uh, Judy Byington talks about it and she posts daily on the, uh, the updates. So the, um, the new QFS system has been separated from the SWIFT financial system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yes. you know, and uh, just as of the day, the day, two, day or two before, ago, excuse me. Yes. And so um, the banks are scrambling. I, uh, she also mentions that um, hundreds of bankers at Goldman Sachs and other places have been um, arrested and uh, Goldman Sachs is being fined billions of dollars. There's, there's just a ton of information coming out now. Uh, as for Nassara, uh, I listened to Gene uh, Cosenzi or Gene Decode uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. Me too. I really like yeah. him. I really appreciate him too. Oh, I do too. And I've watched him for quite a while. Uh, he's, he's introduction of um, these prosperity payments, because a lot of people, when they heard about it, went out and charged a lot of things, bought homes, bought boats, bought all sorts of stuff, thinking that the debt was going to be wiped out. And that's really not the point. <laughs> you know, the, the point is we're, we're, it's a complete change. We're going for a system that is, puts people first and puts individuals first. And we're going back to constitutional law People ask me about it and they, oh, they'll say, well, you said this was going to happen and you were wrong. And I said, no, I'm not. You just have to be patient. Exactly. And in, yep. in this day of, they've conditioned everyone to instant gratification. Yeah. Yep. You know, and people have to learn to sit back, relax, take a deep breath and things will play out. Yes. You know, there's nothing to worry about. It's all really already done. We just have to expose it slowly and let the educate the people. That's my feeling. So yes, it's gold back now. Are you there, Robert? Yes, I am. Okay, you sometimes, me? you know, we have those moments. Do you, do you, uh, do you feel like I do that um, next year we are already leaving it? It's in stages, but I feel like the you know, they, I know that there is a new currency that is like a um, treasure note, mm. treasury note. Right. We already printed out, and this mm -hmm. will be replacing the old fiat money. So right. do you think like, um, like I always say this, that if Trump announces it will be the same day when the federal bank was created. So he will reverse the history because it was in December, 21st right. of December. Um, so how do, you feel, do you feel like me about this, Robert? How do you feel about it? Yes, I, I do. And um, now I'm, I'm wondering about the election because they were talking about the, the QVS, the quantum voting system, but they haven't announced it. And so I'm starting to think that it might go as like Charlie Ward mm -hmm. has said, that they might let the, um, uh, the hack voting system or the, uh, you know, the criminal, uh, I'm searching for the word now. The old system still. Yeah, uh, they might let Biden actually win knowing that he really didn't and then and expose the fraudulent system. Okay, I, 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 I know what you mean and it's very possible it can go this way. Yeah, um, so, so then if we're going to go to December 21st for mm -hmm. the new announcement of the new Nisara system, uh, that kind of makes sense to me right now. But again, I don't know. I, I have to wait and see. 
but I, you know, it, it comes down to be prepared for anything and don't worry about it. It's all under control. And Robert, this whole process of cleaning the energy of California, you know, uh, I had another right. yesterday. She is uh, a medium and a seer. She's very, very, she works with the spirit guides and she's very in tune to this. Uh, she reads energy. Mm -hmm. She said it will take some time for California to clean, for the spirit to clean this energy of what was happening here for so long. To purify, right. to purify this this area, right. uh, and when we spoke, and I remember you told me that it it will be fine and it will go through this. But do you see? Do you feel from your your heart, your spirit, any time frame like how long it might take this transition for California? I I keep hearing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I keep hearing about the Ides of March for a lot of information. Uh, coming out uh, as to the uh, arrests and uh, trials being exposed, even though some have already happened. Uh, it's, it's going to, there is a transition. I mean, many people are just going to be devastated. The, um, the lower, <laughs> I call them the background people, which is maybe not nice. It's, uh, I try not to deal with them. The negative, the, their negative energy is just, too hard to deal with. Yes. It's like going into a store and, and, and being said, oh, your mask is not covering your nose. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> no. And um, thank God they got to know me now. They don't bother me. But uh, it's... And do all we can to explain what's happening and to reassure people. That's where I feel. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to take a while. Um, I, I kind of have been referring to the world as a, um, that we've been living in as a 3D Disneyland with all of the connotations of Disneyland where it's Main Street and Apple Pie and Mom on the surface, but underneath it's a very different world, you know, mm -hmm. with a, yeah. So, so that's what's been going on in, in California. And um, I, I've been very surprised uh, to learn that some friends from the, from the St. Francis Yacht Club uh, sailors that I've known are uh, involved in the pedophilia and uh, you know and they're big bankers and corporate execs and stuff. It's really heartbreaking. Yeah it is it is however I used to help my father when I was in my early 20s with the children of some of his clients he called the the wealthy people he saw as a psychiatrist uh, called them his carriage trade and um uh, <laughs> they actually allowed him to work with people who didn't have the money to pay and the more interesting cases that he took on mm. as a psychiatrist. So, um, but I, I would take some of these kids skiing or uh, camping in the Sierras mm -hmm. to try and get them to open up. And uh, some of them did a bit. Most of them just had a great time uh, when they were not having a great time at home. Uh, so it, it was it was quite interesting. So Robert, yeah. when you were a little boy, remember you told me over the phone. I love this story. It was about. Can you can you tell the story again about the plane? You saw the plane, and you you remember your past life. Can you share it? Oh well, I I don't know if it was past life. I was working on a, a, a public broadcasting show called uh, Over California, and I was flying. Um, they did a lot of it from helicopter, most of it from helicopters, but I did the, uh, the mountain work over Mount Whitney and uh, the Sierras and then uh, some of the, uh, over the Tehachapi Mountains and things uh, from my airplane. And uh, we, we, we were sitting at an airport when the crew was working on their high definition video equipment. And uh, I was chatting with the assistant the production assistant in the car and she just asked me my history and I said well and it just blurted out I don't know where it came from I said oh I was in a, I was a pilot in the Battle of Britain flying a Spitfire and I got shot down it just and, came uh, out from you right it just like it just, it just blurted out just blurted out and I, and I thought where did that come from wow and then that, that got me thinking because when I learned to fly in 1965 I soloed in less than six hours, and that's unheard of. 
and all my life as when I was a kid, amazing I wanted to fly. I knew, I already knew how. I love this. You see, I think, I think we like, we all have it. Like for me, it's like drawing or like writing. We are mm -hmm. born, like we carry on certain skills from the past lives. We do. I've, I've just, I'm recent or I'm new to um, the spirituality and the reincarnation and things in the past two, three years. And so I, I've been putting together a lot of things that's happened in my life. I've had guidance or guardian angels. I've been in thunderstorms in DC-3s where it was a lot of hard work for about 10, 15 minutes. And I didn't even think if I was going to survive or not. I just did what I had to do to fly the airplane and I got out of it. And thunderstorms can tear an airplane apart. You know, you don't go into them. Uh, yeah. I, was in, I was in Canada working on over British Columbia or over beautiful British Columbia for PBS again. And we were in the um, Stikine Wilderness and there's a canyon up there, a river canyon. And um, we were flying down in the canyon and uh, there was a little wind coming over the mountains next to the canyon. And, and it was kind of holding us down. We were very heavy with all the video equipment in there. And suddenly the canyon just tightened up and I had to fly three or four S turns around these sharp bends over a raging river in a canyon that was barely three times wider than the airplane. And I just did it. <laughs> and I did it so smoothly that, that the video was usable and made it into the show. Um, and we got out of it and I thought, well, wasn't that fun. Wow. But I was kind of nervous and shaking a little of bit. Of course. <laughs> So the director of photography in the seat next to me says, well, let's go do that again. And I just said, let's not, <laughs> you know, but I don't know how I made it through, but I just, something took over and I did it. The spirit took care of you. It's unbelievable. Robert, yeah. I want to mention this um, before we end our conversation today, because when I went on your website and I saw the images that you took, the pictures, they are stunning. The, the way you. how you see the earth mm. from the plane, it's so, right. so beautiful. I don't think I have ever seen pictures taken like this that are so beautiful. So can you tell me um, now if someone is interested and would like to have a picture like this, maybe frame it, you know, uh, how they go about it? Like, do they contact you? How does it work? Yeah, they should, could contact me directly. I, I don't have a gallery right now. Uh, in 2008, the TARP, the bank ripoff, the Troubled Asset Recovery Program or whatever it was, when Hank Paulson, um, W's Treasury Secretary, went to the Senate in the middle of the night and held them up for trillions of dollars. That kind of threw us into recession and killed my business. Um, so I don't have a gallery right now, but people can order direct and uh, yeah, uh, deal with me. And then they can, and, uh, so and I then can, you can send to them like different sizes, right, as well. Oh yeah, we, we'll do any size up to about, um, well, 60 by 60 inches or so. No, I love and, uh, pictures. I love my, Robert. I, they are so beautiful. Like I tell you, honestly, I never seen anyone taking the images of the earth from the elevation. Like It's so beautiful, really. Yeah, I, I treat aerial photography as an art form, the way I see it. Um, aerial photography is used for many things, mapping and uh, surveys and all sorts of stuff, but I treat it as an art form. I, I'm so at home up in the air, and that's the way I see the world. It's all the way, also the way I see the connections in politics and everything. It's all global. It's, it's your viewpoint. You know, I'm above the forest. I don't get involved in the trees, you know, what's going on with the little things in front of me. That, I'll leave that for others and I'll give you references, you know, but uh, I, yeah. I see the map. Yeah. So, Thank you anyway. so much, Robert. I want to ask you if, if uh, maybe after the election, let's see, like November, the end of November, there is another topic I want to talk about, which is 9-11, because you know a lot about how the plane can actually affect the building. <laughs> so, right. you, you mean... Um, how does an aluminum airliner right slide into but steel but we building? leave it for another talk because <laughs> yes that's a long story okay. so people can actually hear it from someone who has 
an idea, an experience, what can happen or what can never happen. <laughs> okay. Well, I look forward to it and, and thank you very much for today. It's been Thank you. It's so kind of you to give me your time and I really appreciate this. I will post this uh, video today and I will attach your Facebook page, your website. And uh, yeah, I really recommend to check Robert's work because I am absolutely amazed by, by his photography. It's really, really one of a kind. And it's, it has a very good energy. I didn't say it, but I feel like a really good vibration around it. Well, thank you very much, Anya. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah.